Let's talk about the Browns Ferry Nuclear Power Plant fire. This occurs in 1975. So this is before Three Mile Island, before the Davis Bess incident, before Fukushima or Chernobyl or any other major nuclear accident. This did not make headline news even at the time because there was no loss of life. Now, this was a scary accident because of the risk involved. Now, let me talk a little bit about nuclear power. We won't go into, you know, everything about how it works, but let me just lay the foundation for why this kind of accident is so scary. So power generation occurs when you get a steam turbine, a big old steam turbine. It's you know, the size of a gym or something. You get it spinning with steam. It doesn't matter where you get the steam from. Normally, it comes from the burning of natural gas, burning of coal, burning of oil, to fire a boiler, to get steam, to spin the turbine, to make the electricity. Nuclear power is no different. You have the nuclear fuel, which creates heat, which makes steam, which spins a turbine. What makes nuclear power uh, scary is the risk. Now, all power plants have risk. A natural gas power plant can have a fire and blow up. A oil power plant can have a fire and it can blow up. What they cannot do is spread radioactive fallout over a large region. A disaster at a natural gas power plant is very, very localized. And in the United States, we have a lot of regulations that make sure Potential uh, disasters like a natural gas power plant exploding are away from populated areas. So the risk we've talked about is the combination of impact and probability. The impact of a natural gas power plant having a serious accident is lower because it's very localized. It's more probable because their safety systems are not as robust as a nuclear power plant because the impact of a nuclear power plant having a meltdown or a steam explosion or both and spreading radioactive uh, particles all over the place, the impact is extremely high. Just ask the people uh, that live near Fukushima or the people in the Ukraine that live near Chernobyl. It can happen and it has happened. So we know what the impact is. We want to make sure the probability of that extreme impact is as low as possible. So nuclear power plants have so much safety engineered into them. The safety is baked in to the design of everything. Everything is over engineered to an extreme degree, right? They just take, you know, how thick, do our walls need to be? Let's multiply it by two just to make sure. They do that stuff all the time. Nuclear power plants, their reactor building is designed to take a direct hit from a jet airliner. Now, this was before 9-11. This was in the 1960s when they came up with this. The reason is that a bunch of engineers and scientists sat in a room and asked themselves, what is the worst thing, what's the worst external thing that can happen. We want to avoid that. So if we design it to take the worst thing that can happen, little things shouldn't be a big deal, right? Well, what they found out through this accident and a few others is that even little things can take down a power plant. It doesn't have to be uh, an airplane flying into it or a tsunami. It can be the smallest thing. So that brings us to what actually happened. So there's three reactors at the Browns Ferry site in Alabama. Reactors one, two, and three. Reactors one and two at this time were running at 100% power. So hot, straight, and normal as nuclear people call it. Reactor number three was being constructed. So they had a lot of uh, contractors, including electricians, who are running cables to control rooms. Right? So they have this big room called the, uh, the spreader room. They have things called cable trays. 
essentially just a lot of wires in one room where they can spread them out, put labels on them. That way, if they ever have to track one down, they can find it. Everything nice and organized. So while they're running wires for the new reactor through the existing reactors area, they have to seal the room. The whole facility is under negative air pressure. So they want to always be pulling a vacuum so that nothing can escape the building. So they're running these cables through. They need a temporary seal because they're still working. So what they do is grab a can of great stuff. Great stuff is a closed cell polyurethane. You can get it at Home Depot. You spray it in a hole and it expands. This is yellow foam. It hardens and then seals the gap. Easy peasy. This is just a temporary thing until they can get the permanent seals in after the job's done. So common practice at the time, and probably still now, take a candle, hold it up to the foam, and see if the candle flame just dips over. That will let you know you don't have a good seal and you need to squirt some more great stuff in there. So where it all went wrong, the negative pressure pulls the flame into the cable spreading room, right? It starts a fire. It's not good, right? It's not good at all. The great stuff itself is highly flammable. Plus the cables, the sheathing they're coated in is flammable as well. So now we have a problem. We've got a sealed room that's on fire with a negative uh, pressure, right? So the electricians, do what anybody would do. They take whatever they're holding, a flashlight, and start banging on it, try to get the fire out as quickly as possible, but it's already in another area. They grab a fire extinguisher, spray it in there. It doesn't do the trick. Run up to the security guard, get his fire extinguisher, spray it in there. Doesn't do what they need it to do. Still got a fire going. So let me stop right here in the middle of the disaster and talk about why this matters. So a nuclear power plant, you got the fuel. The fuel is uranium-235, slightly enriched to a, a couple percent, you know, maybe three percent. It's in this giant vessel made of nine inch thick steel. The fuel heats the water. Now you normally have a tons, literally tons of water running through, keeping the fuel cool. I mean, it's still, you know, a couple hundred degrees, but it's not thousands of degrees. You have to keep that water running through the hot fuel at all times. If the water stops, the existing water will boil off and you will expose the red hot fuel to air and the fuel will start to melt when it doesn't have the water to take away that heat. So they thought of this. They have a main cooling system. They have a backup cooling system. The pumps made by different manufacturers just in case there's a common mode failure, right? They've got a totally separate system, the high pressure injection system that's separate from everything, has its own pumps, its own electrical grid. That is on standby and it'll kick in whether the operators tell it to or not electronically. And it will cool down the reactor. The fear is that if something happens and all of these systems fails, you have that hot fuel in there, even after you turn the reactor off, you got that hot fuel for at least an hour if it gets uncovered, say the water boils off, it will start to melt. After it starts to melt, the reactor is a total loss. It can never be economically fixed again. That's the least of your problems. What can happen is the reactor continues to melt if you can't get water in there, and then if you'll build up pressure and eventually you can have a release of radioactivity. Now, in the past, in places like Three Mile Island, this happened and they got a lid on it. No serious radioactive leaks. At Fukushima, they could not quite get a lid on it in time. The meltdown led to a release in radioactivity. At Chernobyl, totally different animal. Chernobyl, they had a steam explosion that blew radioactive stuff 30,000 feet in the air. Different level of magnitude of disaster. Got to keep the fuel cool even after you turn the reactor off because of the decay heat. Right? 
So the fear is if you have a fire in your electrical system, the machine might go haywire, right? What if the pumps turn themselves off because the fire burned up the cables, right? This is the main thing we're worried about as this fire is burning in the cable trays. So they're still working on the fire, right? You wouldn't just walk away from it. You're still going to be got guys down there with fire extinguishers, trying all sorts of stuff. The, re the reactor operators are sharp guys. They, you know, hear fire alarms. They hit the scram buttons, big red stop button on the reactors. Scram say, stands for safety control rod axe man. It's an old term from the 1940s, still use it. They stop the reactor. They got a good hour where they need to keep water on the core. After that, they'll probably be okay. They took the a good action right there. They've got the reactor coasting down, but the fire is still burning down in the cable trays. They start to lose instrumentation. So the last thing they did, they hit the re big red button, they hit the cooling system, but now they're starting to lose control, right? All these wires are burning up. So the guys trying to put out the fire run up to the control room. They say, hey, uh, we've got a fire. Can you help us? The designers of the plant thought this might happen, whether they thought it would happen or they're just being careful. Guess what? They have a fire suppression system in those cable rooms. It's a carbon dioxide system, floods the room, gets rid of the oxygen. They say, cool, hit that button, right? They hit the button, doesn't do anything, right? That's not ideal. So they're trying to figure it out. Eventually they come to the conclusion that because people were working in there, there was an interlock to keep, you know, keep somebody from accidentally hitting that button and suffocating a bunch of electricians. So they hit the whatever interlock button, make sure nobody's down there where the fire's raging. They hit the carbon dioxide button again and goes whoosh, right? Fills the room with carbon dioxide, puts a fire out for a second, and then the fire comes back. Right? So what's going on here? Now we have systems working at cross purposes. So first we had the suppression, fire suppression system in the interlock. Now somebody forgot, or it wasn't in their instructions, that remember the negative pressure we talked about, you need some kind of ventilation for that. So they're actually pulling oxygen into the room while they're hitting this carbon dioxide. So the carbon dioxide doesn't help. At this point, everybody's starting to panic pretty good, right? They call the local fire department. It's been a couple hours now, fire's still burning. So what does a fire department want to do with any fire? They say, hey, let's get hoses in there as quick as we can and get this thing doused, right? The reactor people are saying, no, 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 no. You're not going to ruin all of our sophisticated electronics and cables and you know, millions of dollars of stuff by dumping water on it. Firefighters say, hey, you know, we got water. That's what we have. You know, that's all we can do for you. They haggle for a little while and then it comes to the point where they got to do it, right? They drag hoses in there, basically fill the room up with water fries all of the electronics, destroys the electrical system. They have no control over the reactor, but it's been a couple hours. They got it into the right cycle before all the fire killed all their instruments. Everything's good. No meltdown, but it came close. If a couple of things had not gone in their direction, like at other disasters like Three Mile Island or Fukushima, could have had a serious, serious accident with the release of radioactivity. Now, this caused the plant to be out of commission for years. It takes a long time to build a plant, and it takes a long time to do a complete rebuild of all the electrical systems at that plant. So we avoided disaster, but... This kind of thing is going to keep cropping up again. There's another facility, uh, what you might call a minor accident that we'll talk about, the Davis Bess incident, and then that will lead to the Three Mile Isle, Three Mile Island incident that we can talk about. So there's a couple takeaways from this, right? Although everything kind of ended up good in the end, we had process systems that were affected by the ongoing work. 
So their safety plans did not account for the contractors and what they were doing on the campus, right? Nobody asked them why they were using great stuff or had open flames in the electrical room, right? After the fire started, you had systems that were working at cross purposes, the fire suppression system, the interlock, and then the negative pressure, right? Because there was no plan for if this happened, they just didn't foresee it. What they did foresee were big problems, like a main cooling pipe being severed in half, right? They've got a plan for that. That's like the worst thing that can happen besides the jet airliner stuff. But what really hobbled this plant was a little problem a small fire that became a big fire. It's really difficult to plan for every possible thing, but their safety plans were just good enough to pre prevent a worse disaster. So that's it for the Browns Ferry incident. Uh, a pretty major fire, no loss of life though, a pretty good test of the nuclear industry. We'll talk next time about how they uh, took this incident and implemented new plans and the next incident that happened at the Davis Bess plant. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. This video is part of a course in the Advanced Manufacturing Technology Program at Hudson Valley Community College. We have plenty of courses online, including this one. If you are interested in continuing your education, please go to hvcc.edu and see what might be available for you.